Hi everyone, my name is Eric Friedrich and I'm a content distribution architect at Disney Streaming Services. I'm very excited to be leading off the content delivery track here at ApacheCon 2020. Before I get started, I want to thank all the ApacheCon volunteers and especially our track chair, Dave Newman, for putting together a great list of speakers today. I'll be going through our experiences at Disney Streaming Services and bringing together some of our existing content delivery systems along with Apache traffic control. First, I'll introduce a bit of history, um, then Varnish Cache, and finally how it can be used alongside traffic control. Plan to leave about the last 10 minutes or so for any questions and answers. Our beginnings at Disney Streaming Services came from being part of the Major League Baseball Sports League, uh, responsible originally for live streaming of baseball events. We were spun out into an independent company where we expanded to other live events, such as WrestleMania 34 and Super Bowl 51. For these, we've traditionally leveraged commercial content delivery networks to deliver content from our origin servers to all of our viewers. Uh, as we were acquired by Disney, uh, we also began to take on VOD, which is a much different experience than live. Uh, we started with WWE Network VOD and HBO Now, such as Game of Thrones. And here we saw lower peaks, uh, less bandwidth a peak, but a lot more sustained traffic, kind of the, the baseline was, was much, much higher. And of course, a much more diverse content library. Instead of a few sporting events, it was many, many different pieces of content. And we found that the variety and library size had a large impact on user experience. This led us to stand up uh, not just our own origins, but our own origin shields as well to help feed all the different content delivery networks. I uh, joined Disney Streaming Services in 2019. Prior to that, I was at Cisco and Cinemedia contributing to traffic control. Uh, I've been with Traffic Control since its beginnings as an open source project in 2015, uh, prior to it even coming to Apache through the incubator. And it's been very exciting to see it grow over these last few years. Uh, now, at DSS, I'm working to combine our existing varnish caching infrastructure along with Apache Traffic Control. And that's what we'll talk more about today. <coughs> our goal, like all CDNs, is to deliver great content and great viewing experiences to our customers. All of the content we're responsible for uh, delivering is stored on a set of origin servers over here on the right. These origins authoritatively keep the entire copy of the content library. But of course, while they have lots of storage, they can't handle the load, the bandwidth, the transactions per second to keep up with our viewers. So enter our CDN. We operate a network of origin shield varnish caches and load balancers. These help to scale up and protect the origin from periods of high traffic. The final delivery to our viewers still today occurs through commercial CDNs and open caching nodes. And this entire system is controlled by a custom control plane. Uh, with the origin shields, we started very organically uh, just some Ansible scripts to uh, generate the VCL files you'll see in a second and the load balancers configs. As we built out a more uh, full feature and robust feature set, we moved over to a, a Java web app based on the experiences uh, of our team and, and the skill set they felt comfortable with. So this is what our origin shield tier looks like today. We have multiple clusters of caches serving different geographic regions. Each region has multiple caches and multiple load balancers, so there's no single point of failure. The load balancers are responsible for health checking the caches and hashing requests based on URL across them. The caches are responsible for serving those requests and fetching misses from the origin. 
Now, the clients of these systems are commercial CDNs. Uh, so it's the CDN's job here to localize clients, figure out where the clients are geographically or in the network, and then choose the best uh, edge node, but also the best origin shield cluster to use for a particular request. So for example, um, a viewer in Paris would trigger a fetch from a European origin shield cluster, while a viewer in the US would fetch from a, a North American shield origin region. Uh, and we do have multiple regions within each continent for better locality. Diving a bit into Varnish now. Varnish is a, a highly configurable reverse proxy. It is also open source, not under the Apache license, but under the BSD license, uh, so it's very modifiable. Um, Varnish can do everything that traffic server can, uh, but in my opinion, is a little bit easier to configure. You don't need to use plugins uh, to do many of the things. And Varnish is configurable through what is called Varnish Config Language, or VCL. And this gives you an incredible level of control over request processing, uh, much like the, the header rewrites language, but on steroids. So it, it lets you do remapping, uh, rewrites, of course, um, changing the TTLs of object, custom logging. Um, but it also lets you control the flow of the request through the cache. So you might want to turn a cache hit into a cache miss, um, or you know, based on a certain header, skip over the fetch to the back end. And you can do all of these things with VCL. Uh, there are some advantages to traffic server, though, um, like TLS support native and HTTP3 support. Varnish doesn't have either of those yet. Uh, and in fact, if you want to use TLS with Varnish, you need to bring in a separate TLS terminating proxy, like Hitch or HA proxy. So this is uh, a graph of the different VCL subroutines. A subroutine is, is basically a, a chunk of code that's run during a different part of the request processing and servicing. Each subroutine has different objects available in it. So for example, the VCL receive function at the top has the request object in it, which contains client IP, the HTTP request method, the request headers, uh, and the URL, a few other things. In contrast, VCL deliver, which is the last thing that happens, you have many more uh, objects available there. You have the request, but you also have the object in its metadata that's about to be delivered, and you have the response object, which contains status code, um, response headers and so on. So uh, starting at the top, following the life of a request, uh, VCL receive is the entry point for all requests coming into the cache. Typically, there's some examination of the host header, um, maybe the URL path or request headers here. Uh, from there, the processing moves on to VCL hash, where we create a cache key. Varnish has a, a pretty sane default for this, but if you wanted to customize it, Maybe you want to add something from a request header or a, you know, a fixed string or something else into the cache key, you can do it here. Following that is a, a lookup into the cache to see if the object already exists. Uh, if so, you come over to VCL hit and then deliver, but a uh, more interesting case where there's no object in the cache matching that key, you come over into VCL miss, uh, and then you perform a, a fetch to the back end or the origin. You have two separate subroutines here to both prepare the backend request and fetch, so setting things like um, outgoing request headers to the backend, and then uh, processing the backend response. You might want to do something here like modifying the object metadata. If you want to change the TTL, how long it's stored in the cache for here, uh, you would do that in this function. One other aspect is VCL synth, and we'll see how this is used a, a little bit later. But synth basically lets you create a synthetic response, either containing um, an HTTP status and, and reason line of your choice, uh, or even we'll use it to create a, a custom response body. So these are some of the components of CDN request processing, or, or jobs that every CDN has to do in order to differentiate it from a, a naive, simple cache. Um, We'll take a look at how to build the, the first few of these in VCL, um, but things like delivery service isolation, request scrubbing, and, and backend selection are all things that you can do 
in VCL. The first one of those is delivery service isolation. And this is a way to separate the configuration of different delivery services, say a, a live sports service and a movies on demand service within the same cache. Varnish does this using labels, which are separate bundles of VCL that specify different behaviors. So for example, you could have one label for the sports, another label for the movies. Uh, these labels can be loaded and unloaded independently. So it's a really nice way to be able to change the settings on, on one delivery service without impacting anything else on that cache. You can see in this example um, that we evaluate the label in VCL receive. Basically, we perform a, a check on the host header to see if it matches one of the host names we're expecting, uh, live sports, and if so, we'll activate the live DS label. Otherwise, if it's the movie's host name, we'll activate the VOD DS label. Uh, if neither of those match, we can return a, a 503 error, basically saying we don't know how to handle the request. Once the label is activated um, by returning live DS or movie or VOD, then Varnish restarts processing of the request from within the label using VCL receive a second time uh, in the new bundle of config. Now, this is great for configuration, but it, it doesn't provide isolation within the storage. You know, if you wanted one part of your cache um, to store delivery service A, another part to store delivery service B with no interaction between the two, that would be something that you would need to tackle through the cache key as it's set in the VCL hash subroutine. Request normalization is another task that all CDNs have to do. In this example, we are using VCL to strip certain request headers or, or unset the authorization header. We don't want that to be passed to our origin. We are restricting the HTTP methods that we're allowing to only a get method. Uh, if it's something else like a put or a post, again, we don't want that going back to our origin. So we return a 405 error code for method not allowed. We're using VCL here in a regular expression search and replace called um, regular expression substitution or, or reg sub. We're taking the URL, modifying, uh, searching for anything after the question mark, which is basically the query string and replacing that with a blank. So this lets you strip out the query string um, both in the cache and as requests going to the backend. And then finally, in this normalization step, we're further modifying the URL to add a prefix using another reg sub operation to the beginning of the path. A backend selection is, is one of my uh, kind of favorite operations because it, it really shows the power of what you can do in VCL. Now, in Varnish terminology, a backend is either an origin server or another cache that Varnish goes to to fetch the content from. You can define your backends in the VCL. Here we have one called parent one with this IP address, parent two with this other IP address. Once they're defined, Varnish will start doing a, a background probing or, or health checking um, to check on the health of the backend to, to make sure they're up. And it's got some functionality to say, uh, you know, if the probe fails three times, then mark it unhealthy. Um, if just one failure kind of won't set it off. And there's lots of ways and lots of other customizations you can make on the backend. Uh, and the probes that aren't shown here. This is just a, a simple example. Then uh, we define what Varnish calls a director. And a director is basically uh, a type of policy on how to choose the backend. This happens in the VCL init subroutine, which is a special subroutine not called per request, just called once when you load the VCL. Inside of the subroutine, we're creating a director um, here we're using the random director, which is basically a, a random weight to choose between the different backends with a 10% weight on the first backend and a 90% weight on the second backend. So this one would be seeing the bulk of the requests. There's lots of different backends available in Varnish. Uh, this is just a random one here. There's also uh, hash and shard directors, which use the request URL in order to choose which backend should be used. Um, shard is a, a consistent hash and, and the hash is just a plain hash. Uh, and there's also a fallback director, which does a primary and backup selection based on the, the health of the backend as seen by the probes. 
So once this request comes in, in VCL receive, uh, all we do is simply ask the director for a backend to use. 10% of the time, this will choose parent one, 90% of the time, this will choose parent two. And we give that to Varnish using the special variable backend hint. And this actually determines which backend that Varnish is going to use. Uh, finally, we have a really simple host header remap in the backend request to change the origin host uh, to something the origin is expecting. Now, let's talk a little bit about how we integrated Varnish with Apache Traffic Control. Right now, we're in the prototype stage, looking at adding Varnish and ATC as a component of our overall edge delivery strategy. And this is an existing of our, an extension of our existing origin shield infrastructure that we talked about a little bit earlier with uh, the load balancers and the caches. In this prototype, Varnish is monitored for health by traffic monitor, just the same way TM would monitor an Apache traffic server cache or a Grove cache. Uh, similarly, now instead of viewers coming in through the CDN, viewers are instead uh, localized by traffic router uh, using coverage zone file, GOIP, whatever it might be, and redirected to our new tier um, of Varnish caches this bottom blue one on the left. Just like everything else along the left, this new tier of Varnish caches will fetch from our origin shield as it does today. But notice that there's no load balancer here. Um, we've taken this opportunity to, to change the architecture a little bit and find a way to replace our, our traditional load balancer that has been doing the consistent hashing among the cluster with uh, consistent hashing occurring entirely within a Varnish cluster. So this uses uh, Varnish consistent hashing, the shard backend we were talking about before, and it breaks the Varnish caches into two types, and the type can vary based on request, uh, an edge and a shield. And shield host is the host responsible for caching content and fetching from origin where the edge host handles the request from the client, performs a consistent hash on the URL, and then chooses the shield. So as an example, we could see a client request coming in from the client to Varnish 3. This makes Varnish 3 the edge. Then Varnish, host, then, um, then Varnish 3 looks at the URL, hashes it, and chooses the shield box. In this case, that's Varnish 2. Um, here, Varnish2 holds the cache for that object, and it might need to go fetch it from the origin if it's not already in cache. Then the response comes back from Varnish2, proxied through Varnish3, and back to the client. Uh, looking at this for a separate request, Varnish2 could also play the role of an edge box uh, if that's where the client request comes into. Here, Varnish1 is the shield, but it could be any box. Um, you could even have a box be both the edge and the shield for a given request if that's how the consistent hashing works it out. So what this allows us to do is take away an entire set of components from our architecture. It's much simplified. We don't have a separate set of load balancers to manage now. And everything can be done internally within the same set of, of varnish caches. So this is, is very neat. A next step of our integration was generating configs for traffic control. The first step to do this was implementing the traffic control authentication flow. Um, basically, traffic router and traffic monitor both use Mojolicious cookies or cookies to authenticate with traffic ops. We mimicked those same APIs in our Java web app so that both traffic monitor and traffic router can now obtain um, config files and access the APIs as needed to get their config information. We did have a, a small bug when doing this in Traffic Router. We noticed that Traffic Router in its request flow was not setting the proper content type uh, in the login request. It was setting it to URL form encoded. While this is fine for, for the Go and Perl traffic opses, um, we're using Java Spring, and we just weren't able to, to work around that in any way. 
So we've now fixed it in master so that uh, traffic router can actually set the right content type on its, on its JSON requests. Uh, we'd have to implement a few other APIs. For example, traffic monitor uses the API servers, the server get API in order to get a list of servers. Um, so that's implemented and mimicking the exact same format in our control plane as well. We're hosting the static files from our control plane, like the coverage zone file and the MaxMind database. And of course, we had to generate the, you know, the main configuration files, uh, CR config, monitoring JSON, and SSL keys. Um, as part of our VCL generation in the control plane, which is pre-existing, we're using Apache FreeMarker templates. I'll show you a bit more on the next slide about how this works in order to generate the files. Um, and we felt like it was a really consistent way to continue to do this and expand it for the traffic control files. So let's talk a little bit about that. In order to generate the config files, we have it split up into um, a database of templates and a database of actual configuration variables. We're using another Apache project, of course, Apache FreeMarker, to render these templates into the config files. Uh, FreeMarker combines the variables from the database, which is in you know, whatever database schema, uh, Java, plain old Java object, object hierarchy, um, and kind of mashing them into the templates in order to create the files that traffic router and traffic monitor need. Here is an example of one of our uh, CR config templates. Uh, this is getting a little bit into the guts of traffic router, but I, I'm hoping that most people should be somewhat familiar with this by looking at the snapshot diffs on, on traffic portal. Uh, the templates are kind of dense, so apologies in advance. Um, we can see here the delivery services section within which we are iterating a list iterating over a list of, of all the delivery services in the system. Um, we're able to access some variables in the delivery service, such as the ID and whether we have a particular feature like anonymous blocking turned on. Um, the template language also gives us a bunch of flexibility in when to include or, or exclude certain blocks from the JSON. Uh, so you can see here, we are conditionalizing the presence of this bypass destination block on whether or not that variable exists as it's coming from the control plane. And this is a, a really great way for us to implement feature flippers. Um, we can modify the template separately from deploying code changes to the control plane. So we can implement the change, uh, you know, to add support for this in the template first. And then when the control plane adds the support either in the database uh, or on the web app UI, it, it can actually get activated separately. And that, that's come in very handy for us. Um, operationally, these config files are, are generated very similar to the snapshot, but we're starting to develop some separate control over when they're activated. So just generating the file does not necessarily push it out to the config files, um, to, to the traffic routers and traffic monitors. It just generates it and it sits there until someone goes in and actually says, okay, I want to start using this change. Um, and one of the things that's on our list is to further consider how we can do a staged deployment like this or a canary deployment um, of changes to the CR config because it is such a large um, and critical file. You know, can we do delivery service steering to trial a change on a delivery service or can we roll out a change to CR config to just some of the traffic monitors or just some of the traffic routers to reduce the risk in, in any changes? Here is another example of our CR config template uh, for the cacher or content server section. Here, again, we're listing over all of the caches in the system, printing out the name, uh, cache group, and so on. Here's one part I, I thought was particularly interesting. Um, for the delivery service reference section, or basically which delivery services are assigned to which caches, we're able to combine the list of caches and the list of delivery services or, or properties um, to create the references. So you can see here, we're able to build the delivery service host name based on um, details of the object. So rather than explicitly having to create it in the control plane and then just use a template variable here, we can build it a little bit more dynamically based on whether this is a 
DNS delivery service um, or an HTTP delivery service. You can also see down here that we're able to um, traverse this object hierarchy several layers deep in order to get at different pieces of information. Um, so the template that coming, uh, the context that comes into the template has lots of different objects, lots of different links between objects. Uh, and it's fairly easy to get at all of the data you need, all of the information from the database from any point in the template. This means that small changes to the file syntax or adding something new to the file don't necessarily need a change to the control plane code or deployment of the control plane code. Um, many times a, you know, um, many times just modifying the template and just modifying the database are, are good enough and the, the changes kind of all propagate through automatically. Next is uh, health monitoring of varnish. Basically how we're using traffic monitor to understand if one of our varnish caches is healthy or unhealthy. Just like traffic server has the ASTATS plugin, we needed to implement a varnish module or vmod to provide the health information to tm as powerful as vcl is we're not able to generate an http response body from vcl so we had to write a vmod this is just um you know basically a, a piece of c code a c library in order to generate a response body the vmod astats referent re implementation references uh, the existing ASTATS implementation as much as possible. You know, it uses the same files um, and sysfs interfaces in order to get information about the load average and interface speeds. Um, we have not added in the delivery service stats yet, which are used for things like um, gigabits per second and transaction per second quotas, uh, but it's definitely on our list. We do need to build in some additional instrumentation into Varnish in order to track this information at a per delivery service level. With the VMOD written, here's how we call it from VCL. First, we import the ASTATS module, which tells Varnish we're about to use it. And then we create an access control list of IP addresses that are allowed to see the ASTATS information. And this is something special that Varnish provides, um, you know, for this very purpose of controlling access to certain endpoints. Now, as the request is received, we check the URL to see it starts with ASTATS. This is actually a regular expression check here. Make sure it starts with ASTATS. If so, we evaluate the ACL, making sure the client IP is one of the ones allowed in the list. If it is allowed, we'll set an internal request header to true, saying we're in ASTATS mode, and move to the synthetic response. Otherwise, we jump into the synthetic response without starting the ASTATS, without setting the ASTATS header. And this will indicate that we're just gonna send an error. Uh, VCL synth is down here. Again, we perform a check to make sure that mode is set. And if so, we create a synthetic response body with the output of the ASTATS plugin, uh, just a function called info. Uh, typically, we would pass in here the interface names uh, or anything else that, that comes from Traffic Router, basically passing the, the query string here. And once that comes back out, the entire contents is, is delivered to the client. So this is something we have working today, um, proof that cache polling works of Traffic Monitor with Varnish. Um, you can see our, our bandwidth matches, you know, our 25 gigabit per second interfaces and our load averages is accurate based on what we're seeing on the cache at the time. But this is still heavily under construction and some things aren't working yet. For example, we haven't set up IPv6 on these caches, just a prototype. So we don't have TM polling that yet. Uh, also, these caches are using multiple interfaces sharing in a single IP Anycast address. Each cache has its own Anycast. Uh, so these interfaces aren't bonded. This means that traffic monitor essentially needs to monitor two interfaces per host. Today, the libvmod astats is kind of smashing that together into a single bandwidth that's summed up. Um, but I think it could be pretty interesting for traffic monitor to know and pull uh, somehow individual interfaces, or at least be able to see the health of individual interfaces 
within Traffic Monitor. One other piece of our integration was TLS certificate handling. Um, we had TLS keys and certs that we store in the control plane, and we publish the bundle to both Hitch, which does the TLS termination in Varnish, as well as Traffic Router, which sees um, the same key insert along with a, a little bit of information about the delivery service and, and the host name. Uh, we did find a small bug in the subject alternate name wildcard matching in Traffic Router. There's a PR open right now that uh, is currently under review in order to fix this. Um, and this wasn't too specific to the integration, but more about our naming schemes um, and how we generate our certificates. Uh, I mentioned that we use Anycast on our caches. We also use it on our traffic routers. Um, DNS servers are, are often run using Anycast so that the network can provide localization of client requests. This puts the, the routers in charge of which traffic router the request goes to um, so that it's much closer in the network and provides better performance. Um, in order to do this in traffic router, the embedded DNS server has to bind to port 53 um, both for TCP and UDP, and this is done through the DNS properties and, and server XML file. So um, we added a, a small PR to traffic control. This is also in master already in order to allow you to set the, um, the UDP and, and TCP hosts in these files that was not previously existing. So uh, in conclusion, the integration fortunately went very smoothly between varnish and traffic control. Um, it's a, a prototype at this point, but we're able to put traffic through it and it, it works very well. Um, there is only a few small bits of area needing a little bit of polish and a few tiny bug fixes here and there needed. LibVmod ASATS is, is still under development, but once it's ready, um, hopefully we can get it approved by our open source committee and add it into traffic control alongside ASATS. Um, and finally, we have our custom control plane, so we didn't add generation of varnish config language into traffic ops or traffic portal but that could be a, a very interesting project for an intern summer of code or someone else to take on potentially through the cache side config generation in order to generate vcls and really complete the integration of varnish as a, a first class citizen in, in traffic control so i'd like to thank everyone for attending my presentation today and i'm, I'm glad to open up the room for for any questions at this point Hey, thanks, Eric. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Dave. Sounds like there was one question from Rob. I think you answered. Um, did you write a traffic monitor plugin for the Varnish Health Stats? I think you're good. Yeah. 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 So I wrote, um, we did write a plugin for Varnish that'll speak the traffic router format. Yep. yep. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah. Varnish, we made Varnish itself the A stats format. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He said you answered his question. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. We'll give it another minute. Um, oh, if I see anybody Let's see. Um, Miles Bach asked, I would assume if one is to export varnish stats, they require something custom. Um, yes. So if you're talking about the traffic monitoring, um, traffic monitor uses uh, an HTTP interface to talk with the caches. So if you wanted to get data from Varnish stats, which is uh, you know, access to the Varnish counters, um, then we'd need uh, something custom in order to talk with Traffic Monitor there. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh my gosh. All right, now they're coming in. <laughs> um, here we go. Nir asks, how many layers do you hold? Do you, you also use Varnish as a mid layer? Okay. Yes, so um, we have a really flexible topology. Uh, Varnish for the last few years has been our origin shield, um, and we're looking at expanding it out to the edge. So um, at least two layers, but then depending on how content is flowing at any particular time and, and what the load is on various parts of the system, we're able to reconfigure it to, to push it several layers deep. Um, it's not always fixed at just one or just two, regardless of whether you're using origin shield or, or edge. It's pretty flexible. Great. Um, you answered Miles. Could the stats gathering be performed using shared memory logs instead of a B mod? 
Um, okay, good question. The um, so the stats gathering today is um, mainly looking at the cash load average, which is system load average, and the amount of bandwidth being sent on the interfaces. Um, these two things live in the proc file system or, or in the sys file system, basically like reading the interface speed. Um, so those wouldn't come from the shared memory logs. Those, those just need to come from the system. And the easiest way to get them out is, is through a VMOD. Uh, as we look at expanding to some other types of counters that traffic monitor uses, like number of requests per second um, per delivery service or bits per second for a delivery service, the, the more granular counters, um, we could use custom counters using um, basically varnish allows you to create a custom counter. Um, we could do it using shared memory logs, but then we basically have to parse through all of the logs and add everything up. Um, and that would be a little bit more expensive than just building the, the counter natively inside of varnish, but it, it, but it is definitely an option. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, I think a lot of people are excited. Um, based on what you presented. Um, so I'm sure you'll get some offline questions as well. Yeah. Great. Um, and thanks to you, Dave. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to check out a few of the other presentations this afternoon uh, and see what else is going on with traffic control. Yeah, me too. Great. All right. The next one's at 10.55 um, my time, so 12.55 Eastern. Um, but thanks, Eric. Yeah. Thank you all for joining.